the land, my family's still on this land today. and coin, peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. I know here at a and you're very smart. You're gifted. Today you gradually look beautiful, handsome, and colorful. <laughs> and the class of 1965, you look very colorful. <laughs> but you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> I know some of you know about Popeyes, right? <laughs> uh, Kentucky Fry. But you don't know anything about raising chicken. As a little boy growing up in rural Alabama during the 40s and the 50s, it was my responsibility to care for the chicken. And I fell in love with raising chickens like no one else could raise chicken. <laughs> I know some of you eat a lot of chicken, right? <laughs> but you don't know anything about raising chicken. As a little boy, when I sat in here and was set, I would take the fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hack. I know some of you smart, very smart, right? And I said, now why did this guy mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before he placed them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest. And there will be some old fresh eggs. You had baby tell the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting in. You follow me? You don't follow me. <laughs> so when these little chicks were hatched, I would fool these setting in. I would steal these setting in. I would take these little chicks and give them to another hen. I'd put them in a box with a lantern, raise them on their own, get some old fresh eggs, walk them with a pencil, and encourage the setting in and steal their nest for another three weeks. I kept on fooling and cheating on these setting hands. <laughs> and when I look back on it, it's not the right thing to do. It was not the moral thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do. It was not the most non-violent thing to do. But I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive incubator from the Sister Robux store. Now, as a young graduate, you don't know anything about the Sister Robux catalog. Maybe some of your teachers, maybe some of your parents, Grandparents will know something about it. It's a big book. It's a heavy book. Some people call it the ordering book. Some people call it the wish book. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. I'm wishing. As a little boy, about eight or nine or ten years old, I wanted to be a minister. So from time to time, they help my brothers and sisters and my cousins. We would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard that you would gather here in this hall. And my brothers and sisters and cousins would line the outside of the chicken yard. But they can make up the audience, the congregation. And I was always speaking and preaching. And when I look back on it, some of the chickens would bow their heads. Some of the chickens would shake their heads. They never quite stand in there. But I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to during the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listen to me today in the time. Some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produced eggs. But that's enough of that. As a little boy, when we would visit the little town of Troy, visit Montgomery, visit Tuskegee, visit Birmingham, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But in 1955, 15 years old in the 10th grade, I heard the Rosa Parks, heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on over radio. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Dr. King inspired me to find a way to get in the way. I got in the way, I got in trouble, and I know my name has been changed. I know what to change. I was so inspired by the teaching of Martin Luther King Jr., <laughs> so inspired by the four young students at a and College, that I went down 
to the public library in a little town of Troy, Alabama, trying to get library cards and trying to check out some books. We were told by the librarian that the library is for whites only and not for colors. I never went back to that library until July 5th, 1998 for a book signing for my first book, Walking with the Wind. Many blacks and white citizens showed up. Wonderful reception, wonderful book signing at the end of the program. They gave me a library card. <laughs> so I said to you as you leave, Auntie, you must never ever give up. You must never ever give in. You must keep the faith. Be bold, be courageous. And when you see something that is not right, something that is not fair, something that is not just, you have to speak up and speak out and find a way to get in the way. Find a way. Congratulations to the class of 2015. Congratulations. I want to also thank the class of 65. 65. And maybe, just maybe, the class of 2015 can learn something from the class of 50 years ago. Just think 50 years ago, here in this part of America, here in the heart of the American South, hundreds and thousands and millions of people could not participate in the democratic process. Couldn't register to vote simply because of the color of your skin. We changed that. We changed that. So the same hands back in 1965 Back in 1964 and 63, they picked cotton, plucked tobacco. Those same hands helped pick the first African-American president in the history of our country. So when somebody tell me that nothing has changed, I feel like saying, come and walk in my shoes. I see change. I know what it is. In our own lifetime, we have witnessed what I like to call a nonviolent revolution. A revolution of values, a revolution of, of ideas. And you who have been educated, have been trained here at this wonderful university, you have an obligation. You have a mission, you have a mandate. Get in good trouble, necessary trouble to reach back and help those who have been left out and left behind. When we look at Baltimore, Ferguson, New York, and other places around our country, the fires of frustration and discontent of Rene, you must help put out those fires. Use education, use your talent, use your skills to leave this little piece of real estate, this little planet we call Earth, a little greener, a little cleaner, for generations yet unborn. Now look, I'm a member of Congress. Long before I was a member of Congress, <clears throat> I was out there pushing and marching, beating up bloody, almost died at that bus station in Rock Hill, South Carolina, at that bus station in Montgomery, Alabama. On that bridge in Selma, beaten and left bloody. But I'm here today as a living witness, as a living witness that if you believe, you can overcome and you will prevail. So get out there, push and pull, and make this university very proud of you. One little story. Well, this is your day. It's not my day. This is your day. Enjoy it. Take it all in. When I was growing up outside of Troy, Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, I had an aunt by the name of Sineva. And my aunt Sineva lived in a shotgun house. She didn't have a green manicured lawn. 
and a simple plane there you are. And sometime at night, you can look up through the holes in the ceiling and count the stars. Then it will rain, should we get a pail, a bucket, or a tar and catch the rainwater? From time to time, she will walk out into the woods and cut branches from a dogwood tree and tie these branches together and make a broom. And she called that broom the restroom. And she will sweep this dirt yard very clean, sometimes two and three times a week, but especially on a Friday or Saturday.